Welcome to a new edition of Human Dialogues. I'm Jessica Lockhart, Director of the International Institute of Humanology, and I am connecting today all the way from Spain uh, to speak to someone who's almost at the other end of the world, across the ocean. I am going all the way through to California because I have a very special guest today who's going to be talking about something that I'm sure many of you will feel um, like it rings a bell somehow. We're going to be talking about turning failure into a blessing. The topic we have this month at the Institute is the fear of failure. And of course, turning failure into a blessing is everybody's dream, I would say. The guest I am so very proud and happy to introduce today to you all is none other than wonderful, fantastic, imaginative and very creative John Vorhaus. John is best known for his comedy writing classic, The Comic Toolbox, How to be Funny Even If You're Not, which I happen to translate into Spanish. And he is taught and trained uh, writers in 37 countries on five continents, that's his last count, and created TV shows of his own in Nicaragua, Romania and elsewhere. His writing credits include dozens of teleplays and screenplays, plus seven novels and some two dozen works of nonfiction. His latest book is The Little Book of Stand Up. Vorhaus is a graduate of Carnegie, of Carnegie Mellon University and a member of the Writers Guild of America, and he lives in Southern California uh, and secretly controls the world from www.johnvorhaus.com. So you can contact him if you feel like talking to someone who I'm sure will give you a lot of inspiration. John, welcome to Human Dialogue. So happy to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. As you were reading my bio, I realized I create books more frequently than I update my biography because my latest book is actually no longer the little book of stand up. It's my brand new book, The Book of Practice, How to Do Better What You Want to Do Well. So once again, my bio has been overtaken by events. <laughs> and didn't you see that I doubted? Because I knew about your latest book and I was like, uh, wait a minute, this doesn't ring true. So, yes. John, should we re-record it? Oh, we've covered it. <clears throat> okay. All that says is, all that, I mean, that leads right into a discussion of what's going on there. <laughs> I have a lot, a lot of outcomes. <clears throat> Every book I write is an outcome. Some of those books are successful, some are not successful, some are widely read, some are not read at all. But in my mind, they are all, each and every one of them, simply an outcome. And I figured out that my job as a creator is nothing more or less than to pile up outcomes. It doesn't matter whether they're good outcomes or bad outcomes, successful outcomes or what we might call failed outcomes. The act of creation is itself the win that we seek. So just because that outcome didn't work out exactly the way we expected it to, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It just means that's the outcome we had. And it's not like we haven't got any experience on our backs. We can just deal with this and that's okay. Well, I think uh, that you and I both have a lot of speaking experience and it's okay when these things happen. We just continue talking, we just pick it up where it fell and we just continue making the best out of the worst possible situation, which is basically what we're gonna be talking about today, right John? We're gonna be talking about turning failure into a blessing. <laughs> Right on, right on. So, John, when I asked you to speak about this topic, what is the first story that came to your mind? I, I know exactly what it was. It, it, in, it involves, this will sound improbable, it involves the crab of bad ideas. Now, you must wonder, what is the crab of bad ideas? Let me see if I can unpack this. I was teaching a workshop in Prague, and it was a, a pretty big workshop. There were 100, 150 people. It was quite a crowd, more of a lecture than a workshop. And one of the ideas that I was stressing was the value of investing in bad ideas, being willing to have bad ideas, with the understanding that the idea itself is not necessarily good or bad. It might lead to something that is useful 
in problem solving, whatever you're trying to do, a painting, a script, whatever. Uh, there's value in passing through bad ideas to get to good ideas. However, there's a certain amount of self-consciousness that comes with how do I dare to voice a bad idea? What do I do with all of the rejection that I fear I will feel? For one reason or another, there existed in this classroom a stuffed crab like a child's toy that, <laughs> that uh, a kid would drag around by a claw. And I decided, okay, well, that's gonna we're gonna call this thing the crab of bad ideas. And when any whenever anybody in the room has a bad idea, they get to hold the crab until the next bad idea comes along. And this is just a simple mechanism for letting people feel free and playful in creative spaces and more willing to say what's on their mind. But Jessica, that's only half the story. Is here's the other half, and this is the part. <laughs> this I, is the part that I'm really, not surprised. You always come up with something, always, something else. I, I always have more than one story. Um, so I'm. I, we've established the crab, crab of bad ideas, and now I'm lecturing on. And I reach the point in the lecture where I start to talk about a storytelling tool that I know very well. And as I start to go into my um, presentation, my explanation, I realize I no longer know what this means. I have no, literally no idea what I'm talking about. And I don't know if it was a brain fart, if it was just I lost <laughs> track of the material, something I failed. I felt myself failing. And as I felt myself failing, I said to myself, what can I do with this? Well, in the spirit of the, the crab of bad ideas, probably the best thing that I can do is just acknowledge what I'm going through. So I said to the class, guys, I've lost the plot. I thought I knew what I was talking about, but I don't. We're going to take a five minute break while I try and figure this out. And we took the break. I got back on track. La, la, la. Uh, the day continued and ended and then it segued, as these things often do, into a, a bar or tavern type situation. I had spies working in the crowd and what they reported back to me was of everything that I did during that day, the thing that everybody liked best was when I modeled failure, was when I was unafraid to say, I've lost my place, I've lost the plot, I got to take a step back. And on reflection, I realized when a person in authority fails, and the teacher is a person in authority, when a person in authority fails, it sends a very strong message to everyone else, it's okay to fail. And since then, I want to tell you, honestly, I have practiced modeling failure in all my presentations. I look for reasons to mess up and then acknowledge how I've messed up just because I know on a, on a subconscious level, that's going to make everybody feel at ease. So what we can extract from this is failure is not an absolute state. Failure is a state that we have a relationship with. And that relationship is something that we can change to suit our needs. In simplest terms, if you fail and feel bad, you lose. If you fail and feel good, you win. And so a lot of my practice is based on this idea of how can we take something that looks like a bad outcome and rethink it so that it turns into a good outcome. Pause. And it's funny because that's something I learned many years ago. When I was quite young, my uh, father asked me to start working for him in his language school. I was 16 and I was trained by him to teach English as a second language. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things he used to teach us was the best teachers are not the ones who know everything, but the ones who can help the students get the information they need at a certain moment. So I always taught my clients, other teachers, interpreters, when I was a simultaneous interpreter, that it's much better to acknowledge that you don't know something than to pretend that you do know and give some false information or 
mislead your clients or your students and drive them crazy. It's better to say, you know what? <laughs> you know what? I don't happen to know that the answer to that question right now, or I just forgot, or it just slipped my mind. Can I get back to you with that answer? We fear when, that we're going to lose it. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. 10 out of the 10, uh, our, our clients appreciate it. They thank you for it. But if you say, you know what? Um, and you invent something. Well, I think that it could be this or that or... And then they discovered that you didn't really know what you were talking about. Not only do you look like uh, someone who doesn't know the field, but you also look like uh, somehow an idiot because you're pretending to know something when you don't really know it. Do you understand what I mean, John? I, un I understand exactly. It has to do with motivation. We fear to surrender authority. We fear to look bad in the eyes of people who are looking up to us. And if, if we're sufficiently driven by the fear of losing status, then we will take actions and make choices to protect our status. If we understand that status isn't really central to the transaction, but communicating effectively is central to the transaction, in this case, teaching effectively, then our motivation shifts. Now I'm no longer trying to protect my status. I'm just trying to help you do better what you want to do well. Mm -hmm. And if that means admitting that I don't know something, I literally have nothing to lose because I've stopped investing in the the whole question of do I have anything to lose at all? But you know, and I know that that takes a while to get to. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the reasons that I wrote the book of practice was this sense that now that I'm a little older, a lot older, I'm a lot calmer. I'm a lot less fearful. I'm a lot more relaxed than I was. And I find myself asking, how did I achieve this state? Well, in one sense, all I did was grow into it or age into it. You reach a certain point in your life where you realize, what are they going to do to me at this point? Kill me? That's pretty much right around the corner anyhow. So I don't have to worry about that. But, but reflecting on my youth i realized that when i was as i described it at the at the time a young uh, serial creative entrepreneur i didn't know what i was doing and i feared making mistakes and so i i existed in this kind of haze of hysteria where my path forward was not clear and my emotional relationship with my path was not healthy this is a function of youth a lot of times. It's something that we can grow out of, but it's also something that we can minister to or self-minister to every day, where we just ask ourselves, who am I now? How do I feel? And so I wrote the book of practice to be kind of a roadmap for young strivers such as I was at a time when such a roadmap didn't exist. But even at that, it feels a little disingenuous because I can say, as I do in the book, if you must fail, and you will fail, fail big, set that as your aspiration and your goal. And it's right there in print, and students can look at it, and readers can read it, and they say, yeah, man, fail big. But if you're 25 years old, and you're a young songwriter, for example, and you're getting up on stage, and you're trying to sing a song, and remember how to play the chords, and remember all the words, and eye contact with the audience, and oh, did my voice break, and what happens if they love me, and what happens if they hate me? You, you end up in a stew of confusion inside your head, and it's very hard to clear out that confusion and see where you are and effect, act effectively in your own interest. So I yeah, would say that the this, fear, that's what... Yeah, the fear of failure yeah. is what makes it grow and grow and grow until it becomes unbearable, like any other fear, because that's what fear has, you know? Fear always starts very small. It's a little question in the back of your head. What if? What if they see through me? What if I say it wrong? What if I can't remember? What if, what if, what if? And that what if grows and grows and grows until it controls us instead of us controlling it. And I think I that... Great... Yeah? Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I think that uh, part of the mechanism that allows us to turn failure into a blessing is by actually taking control of that fear 
when it's still small and manageable, when it doesn't control us. Because if it does control us, if the, the fear of failure is so huge that it occupies everything in our mind, in our world, there's no room for anything else, not even uh, blessings or success. So and for, cre for creative people in particular, the fear is paralytic. It will stop us from creating. And that's the biggest tragedy there is. Here's the example I use to describe what you're talking about. I'm at a cocktail party and I think of a joke. You know me, I think of jokes all the time. I know. I, I, met, I, I used to translate you live <laughs> and on the spot. So I remember, yes. Yes, I, I not only think of jokes all the time, I also use words that aren't real words all the time. A you challenge make them for up. people yes. like you. <laughs> yeah. So there I am at a cocktail party and I'm thinking of a joke. And I think to myself, maybe I'll tell this joke. But even before the words are out of my mouth, a little voice inside my head, a voice that I call my ferocious editor, says, hang on a second there, John. Think before you speak. Because if you tell that joke, it might not be funny. And if it's not funny, they might not laugh. And if they don't laugh, they might not like you. And if they don't like you, you can't like yourself. And if you no longer like yourself, then you must experience full ego death and pass away. <laughs> and I realized I'm putting the entire sum and substance of my, my whole ego, my whole sense of self, is now resting on a joke I haven't even told yet. Mm -hmm. That that illustrates to me the flaw in that chain of thinking. Now, we can call it a flaw, but let's not assign a negative value judgment to it. Let's not say it's a flaw in thinking, therefore it's bad, therefore I'm bad. Otherwise, we get right back into the same negative cycle, this vicious cycle of self-judgment and self-recrimination. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just part of our process. And because it's part of our process, it's something that we can work on to improve. So when you speak of turning failure into a blessing, the real blessing, it seems to me, is looking at fear and looking at failure so often and so honestly that these things lose power over you. And once that happens, then you are in a literal spiritual sense blessed yeah yeah and there's something else i would say um, let's see if you agree with that too john failure in itself is a blessing because even when you fail failure always comes with a possible lesson to learn a next step to take um, um a new way to start doing things. Failing <laughs> is never the end of the road or should never be the end of the road. So failing in itself, in, in its own value, is a blessing in disguise too. Would you agree? I do agree. And I'll yes and that, as they say <laughs> in improv comedy. Yes, and also, if you look at the creative act in its most abstract sense. All creativity is, is making a choice. I, choice. I choose to name a character Bob or Sheila. I choose to paint the canvas yellow or blue. These are the fundamental choices that we make. The act of creation is the act of making choices. There's nothing in that that speaks to making good choices or bad choices. After we've made the choices, then we evaluate them and either approve them or change them. But if we think of creation as making choices, then we don't have to worry about failure at all because every single time we make a creative choice, we are succeeding in doing the creative act, which is making choices. This is another way to get out of this endless trap of, I don't know if it's any good, but I don't think it's good enough and therefore I hate myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because we've been drilled <laughs> to consider failure something destructive and utterly uh, 
negative Shameful. and something we should try and avoid no matter what because we live in societies that are highly competitive we are raised to believe that we have to be number one and successful at everything we do and that not being number one is absolutely disgraceful <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think we have to change the discourse. I think we have to really start acknowledging that what's been taught for years and years and years now is so obsolete and so outdated. We need to see the world from a completely new, different perspective. I couldn't agree with you more. As you were speaking, I was reflecting on my own recent experience. As you know, Jessica, I live in Los Angeles, but I try to take frequent trips to Europe. And one of the things that I do when I'm planning these trips is send out a lot of emails to a lot of people. And I can't help sending out these emails without thinking about certain groups of people or individuals reading these emails and saying to themselves, this idiot again, <laughs> you know, he's he's still out there <laughs> flogging his comic toolbox and trying to get trips overseas when is he going to grow up? Well, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to grow up. So let's leave that aside. But I don't, I'm aware of that reaction, but I don't dwell on that reaction. Why? Because some small percentage of people are going to email back and say, oh, you, we really enjoyed your presentation last time. Can't wait to see you again. If I dwell on the negative, I can never experience the positive. If I'm afraid of negative outcomes, I never get the blessing, to use your word, of positive outcomes. I never get the rush of opening an email and seeing somebody say, yeah, please come to Berlin or Amsterdam or Barcelona or Madrid, wherever. So as a practical matter, people who desire to achieve cannot afford fear. Because fear will block achievement. As a practical matter, people who desire to succeed have to embrace failure because failure is part and parcel of the process. You'll remember from the comic toolbox, which you translated, <laughs> the rule of nine, which yep. says for every 10 jokes you try, nine won't work. And that seems like a terrible rate of failure until you break it down and you realize, well, that means I have to create 10 jokes, but I only have to have one work. Mm -hmm. So instead of investing 100% of my ego in the only joke I have, I can distribute my ego 10% per joke across all these 10 jokes. And the ones that don't work, that didn't hurt me anymore. Yeah. If it sounds like I'm manipulating myself into thinking about things differently, I absolutely am. And I totally recommend the technique. It works a treat. Yeah, because... At the end of the day, life is the way we tell ourselves it is like. I always, well, I wrote a little book called uh, What Story Do You Tell Yourself? And at the end of the day, life is what you make of it. If you tell yourself that life is a horror movie and that people are chasing you and after you, that's how you're going to live and that's how, you, how you're going to see the world. If you live a story that's more like La La Land in which everything's uh, happy-go-lucky, fantastic, and uh, and uh, there's fun everywhere, that's what you're going to be living. At the end of the day, we get to choose how we see the world, which is partially what you were saying right now. And failure can have a very heavy negative burden uh value or it can be an uplifted uplifting motivator to get us into doing more things i failed let's try something else ah uh, this one didn't work okay i can try the other one you know it can also be a springboard for doing more things it, is, it also becomes your body of work mm -hmm. the uh, let's take the example of of a screenwriter such as myself I've written at least 10 failed screenplays for every successful one. And that's that might even be generous. But it also, I don't even know what I mean by failed or successful at this point. 
is it successful if I wrote it the way I wanted it to wanted to write it or is it successful if somebody bought it and shot it? We can argue that. That's not the point. The point is I got to play the game 10 times. I got to write 10 screenplays. I cannot help but be better at my craft for having gone through all of, of that practice. And th maybe this is another way of looking at the big picture. If you think of the work you're doing as practice and not as outcomes at all, but just something that you're doing to get better, then you realize that whether you do it well or not this time, you are doing it and that is contributing to making you better. The only thing that doesn't make you better is doing nothing. Doing anything, no matter how badly, will get you working better than you were before. But, There's, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I was thinking about this from the point of view of, of somebody listening, and I'm not exactly sure, sure who I'm imagining, but when, I'm imagining somebody who says, well, that's all well and good for you. You're a successful creative entrepreneur you know you you got past your failure into success it's no wonder everything looks like a a fluffy pink cloud to you mr vorhaus because you're living the dream meanwhile i'm living the nightmare <laughs> my heart goes out to that person i'm really sympathetic to that person but i would say that if you perceive that your life is a hundred percent bad it's unrealistic to say, I'm going to turn it from 100% bad into 100% good overnight. That's not going to happen. But is it reasonable to expect that I can turn it from 100% bad to 99% bad? Can I make it 1% better by doing something that I find easy and fun? And if I capture that outcome, that sense of, ah, I wrote something that I didn't completely hate or just I wrote something, suddenly things are a little less bad than they were before. And that's the platform I can stand on to make them a little less bad and then a little more or less bad and a little more or less bad. And in this way, move from the nightmare to the dream, if we can put it in those terms. So maybe part of what makes this whole thing work is a realistic appraisal of where you are and where you're headed next and how to get there in small steps. Yeah. Somebody in uh, in in um, uh, in an interview, somebody asked me, can you tell me what the book of practice is about in a nutshell? And here's what I came up with. It said, with awareness and acceptance of practice. Oh, sorry, I got it wrong. Try it again, but we're OK. It's not. Are failure. you failing me? Like, <laughs> I'm modeling failure. I'm blowing my own tagline. <laughs> With awareness and acceptance of practice, I got it wrong again. With awareness and acceptance of passion and purpose, fantastic practice can happen. Awareness, I see what I'm at, where I'm at. Acceptance, I'm okay with where I'm at. My passion, that's the stuff I'm good at and enjoy doing. And the purpose is the reason I'm doing all of this in the first place, so that I can have a life that I feel proud of. The simple act of saying, I see myself, opens the door to that 1% gain that turns into a 2% gain and a 3% gain. So if there's somebody out there listening to this or watching this and saying, none of this applies to me because I am at bottom and can't get up from at bottom, my point would be, if you're at bottom, there's really only one way you can go from there, and that's up. So embrace it and enjoy it and watch your life rise. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking that some people might say, yeah, you're like those optimistic people that only see the good in everything, even if it's bad and failure is failure. <laughs> and I think it's important to also highlight or mention that Failing is failing, yes. You know, you try something, you don't get where you want to get. And that is negative in a way. Accept it. But then look for how you can use it. It's not like, okay, I failed, that's it. I close the door and I leave. I go home. No, it's like, okay, yes, I failed. I accept it. Is there anything I can do with this? Uh, can I perhaps use this failure and uh, reshape it somehow so I can obtain something new out of it? Can I use it somehow? 
because at the end of the day, we cannot move forward unless we accept where we're standing, which is part of what you were saying right now. We need to accept the failure if we want, if we want to move away from it or if we want to build on it. Because if not, we don't know where we're standing. I've reached the point in my life where the only word that matters to me is acceptance. If I have acceptance, I'm okay. If I don't have acceptance, I need to try to get to acceptance as quickly as possible. To give you an example, you know I'm a pretty sporty guy. I like my physical activity. So I was out running around a couple of weeks ago, and I pulled a hamstring. And the minute I pulled this muscle, I said to myself, well, I'm not going to be able to run for a month at least. I just know it. And my first thought was, this sucks. Poor me. I hate myself. I hate my life. Everything is miserable. The dark clouds descend. The very next thought, like right on the back of that thought was, this is an opportunity for me to work on my acceptance. It's a hard thing to accept. I'm not going to get to run for a month. But if I use it as an opportunity to practice my acceptance and get better at acceptance, I'm just better off in all aspects, in all respects. Jessica, I want to take this to a higher and deeper level by saying I consider the only meaningful job of my life is to put myself in into acceptance of my own death. I want to arrive at the moment of my death psychologically, spiritually, mentally prepared to say I can accept what's happening to me now. And I appreciate and understand that everything I experience as failure or setback is an opportunity for me to work on this muscle of acceptance and, and hone it and refine it and strengthen it so that it will ultimately do the one job it needs to do, which is to get me out of this life and into whatever happens next without freaking out or feeling bad. That's my ambition. That's my goal. And my strategy for achieving this goal is so simple. Keep having outcomes and don't care what they are. I love it. Thank you for that inspiration, John. I'm sure it's going to inspire a lot of our viewers. I think I'm going to stop the interview here. I think we shared a lot of ideas with our audience. I'm sure they will use many of them. I I love talking to you. I always told you so. I know you will come back to the Institute of Humanology. We have more conversations. We'll continue building this uh, conversations that we have once in a while and uh, touching upon different topics. But I think what you just said can't get any better than that. I mean, what else can we say but that? <laughs> so thank you so much, John. I love that inspiration. And I thank you for sharing it with me and with our audience. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And I hope to have you soon in another one of our events here at the International Institute of Humanology. I thank you for your time, your wisdom, your inspiration. And I invite all our viewers to make, uh, write their comments, ask their questions. You're watching this in our magazine and also on YouTube, please keep the conversation alive. I'm Jessica Lockhart. This is the International Institute of Humanology and it show Human Dialogues with John Vorhaus today. Thank you and see you in our next edition of Human Dialogues. Bye.